Wow, finally, welcome everyone to the Express Entry live Facebook event. I am so happy to be here with you. My name is Mark Holfe. I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and high school teacher. And lately, I'm also going to add on volleyball coach, because as if I didn't have enough already to do, I volunteered to coach our local high school volleyball team, which we were victorious last night in our game. But while I've had all of this going on, a lot of you have, um, I know, have been waiting patiently for me to chime in and be involved with our, our Facebook group, our Express Entry Law Facebook group. And uh, I want to apologize for not being more present. And if some of you have watched the previous video that I did, I shared some pretty sad <laughs> uh, stories about the fires that were raging through um, my beloved Waterton National Park. And so we were a little concerned about that uh, as a family. We've got a cabin that's close to Waterton. And some of you are probably wondering, well, what is Waterton? Well, Waterton is one of my favorite retreats. It's one of the favorite places that I go uh, to basically unwind and de-stress from the world that's crushing down upon me. Well, anyways, I've had all of these things going on. And because of that, I have not been able to be as active in the group as I'd hoped. But I want to express appreciation to all of you for hanging in there. We are about half an hour. Well, it's 7.40 p.m. So we are really late to getting this thing launched. And so I want to express um, appreciation to all of you guys for hanging in there, waiting for me as I go to get this lovely course um, announced and launched and to do this live Facebook Express Entry event. So I see that we've got Nabil and Ahmad is here with some thumbs up. Um, if you guys can just post right now while we're waiting for others to join, because a lot of people are probably thinking, well, what is this guy doing? Is he ever going to do this? Well, we're live now. But what I'd like you to do is just to give me a little sound check to start with and give me a thumbs up if the audio is okay and you can hear me clearly because I want to make sure that everybody can hear me really clearly. All right. Then I want you guys to tell me where you are listening in from. So where in the world? Post where you're from. So we've got uh, lots of thumbs up for people uh, with respect to the audio. So Claudia... Sandy, Pamela, Chaudhry, uh, we've got lots of thumbs up there. And uh, let's see. Okay, audio loud and clear. Sunita, audio is good. Awesome. That's fantastic. All right. So just post in the comment section where you guys are from. Okay, so we've got Lahore. Chaudhry's Lahore. Uh, Laureen is Trinidad and Tobago. Cool. This is awesome. Just keep posting. Oh, here they come. St. Vicente. Uh, St. Vincent, Sunita, uh, Pamela's in Houston. Pamela, you yourself, you have had to deal with some terrible tra travesty. The weather is crazy. I hope that the floods are subsiding. I've got some good friends in Houston, and I know that you guys have been battling your own uh, natural disasters. So I, 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 my heart goes out to you there in Houston. Uh, London, uh, India, um, Vishal is Gujarat, India. Claudia is Germany. Uh, Nalina, <laughs> Nalini is Mumbai. Um, Obed is India. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining me. This is going to be a fantastic event. And Pamela said, yes, we got flooded. I am so sorry, Pamela. All right. Well, you guys, this is going to be amazing. You can see there's a little bit of a funky glow, and that's because of my lighting situation which is the bane of my existence. So you can, <laughs> I unplugged it. All right, this is awesome because you guys, as you can see, I'm Mark Holthy, I'm doing this all myself. So it is real. There is no background fancy people doing this. Uh, this is just me. So give me a second while I replug this light in. Give me a second.
I, I want to apologize, guys. It looks like I dropped off there. I'm not sure. We've had a little bit of issue with the Internet. It's kind of ironic. The day that I actually want to um, do this live express entry uh, video event is the day the Internet's kind of wonky here in the firm. And so I'm hoping that everybody, I didn't lose you. Did I, I did, it did drop there for a little bit, didn't it, everyone? I think it did. Anyways, I know I'm talking a lot, but anyways, I've got a light here because it's dark now, and we've actually had a little bit of rain today. So I want to express appreciation to all of you awesome uh, listeners and followers who, um, when I reached out and said, hey, pray for rain, that's exactly what we've got. So those fires are being quenched, and we're getting the water now that really, hope, you know, down in Houston, the flooding that they've had, well, hopefully we're now taking some of that water back here to, to water the ground and put out the fires and send our dry temperature down to, uh, to Houston. So anyways, uh, I apologize for any uh, disruption in our feed there. But I think we are just about ready to get this thing on the road. Now, we'll wait just a couple more minutes for other people to, to join us. And then what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to get uh, a few things ready on my desktop and um, uh, in preparation for us doing our um, live event here. And it's always fun when you're trying to talk and do other things. So, uh, so hang in there, guys. <laughs> All right, I'm going to be flipping back and forth. It's going to be pretty interactive today. And um, I have a lot of things that I want to share with all of you. And so I'm just going to clear off a few more things off of my messy desktop here and make some room for us to actually share screens. All right, and I'm going to show you a bunch of cool things that I have set aside and let's see. All right. I think we're just about uh, in line here. And we've got people already posting questions. Excellent. I want you to hold your questions until the end. And then I'm going to jump back. And then I'm going to try to answer all of them for you. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> happy lawyer. Indeed I am. I'm very happy now. Okay. So let's, let's get this rolling. I am going to share my screen with all of you. And um, I'm just going to test something out here. I think there's a way if I share my screen, I'm going to make this large. And then I'm going to go back up to the very beginning here where I want to start. All right. And I'm going to make it full screen. Okay. Now what I want to do is I'm going to just... Uh, <laughs> Bear with me, guys, as I sort through this. This is actually quite entertaining. Um, you guys are getting the full experience here today. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to go in through here. I'm going to shrink this down. Now, what I want to do is I, I just need to set this up so that I can um, get rid of my ugly mug when I'm sharing my full screen. Because I know when I do it, it has a tendency to... Uh, keep my photo up in the top left corner, and I don't want that. So let's see if I can sort this out here. I'm going to go back here. Okay, and it doesn't look like I am on there. All right. Do you guys, when I go to full screen, do you guys see my image in the top left corner? Just comment in the, in the section here and let me know if you do. So when I go to full screen like this, can you see my image in the top left corner? Or is it just my little PowerPoint presentation here? And this is where I'm going to help you guys, have you guys give me a little bit of uh, feedback on this. So, um, no, 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 no. Awesome. Woo! We are set. Okay. We are set, folks. Let's get this show on the road. Okay. So right off the bat, this is the... Uh, as you, as a, you've obviously um, figured out, those of you who are tuning in that have not watched anything that I've shared before, this um, presentation is all about express entry. And so many people are asking, well, who the heck is this ugly mug? Who is this guy? And so that's what I want to start off with. And many of you have already heard a lot about my story, but there's going to be Thousands of people that are not going to be able to catch this live because I know right now it's probably about 
7.30 or just about 8 a.m., all the way over in India, where many, in Pakistan, where many of my listeners are watching. And so I want to make sure that as we go through this whole process, um, that I am giving all of the people, even those who are not, who are going to watch this as a recording, a little bit of background on me, who I am, and uh, just put all of this into context. So this event right here is all about Express Entry, and I'm going to be covering some essential tips on submitting your own Express Entry profile, as well as once you get your invitation to apply, and we'll talk a little bit about that, your electronic application for permanent residence. So some critical tips and strategies for all of you. Okay, now here is the start, and I am going to make you guys work today. So I have got a special reward for people who actually are tuning in live, okay? So you guys, I've got a special... I better shut this off here. <laughs> That's hilarious. I've got a special reward for people who are tuning in live. So turn off your cell phones. Well, wait a minute. If you got your cell phone and you're actually watching this on your phone, then don't turn it off. But you guys need to be ready to take notes. Okay? So that's what I need you to do. So I want you to take notes. And I have a special reward for the absolute best note taker at the end or at some point of this presentation, I have a special reward for you. And that special offer is I'm going to give three 30-minute free legal consultations with me to the top three note takers on this Facebook Live event. All right? So this harkens back to my days as a high school teacher. But the reality is what I wanted you guys to do is to pay close attention. So those who do and take good notes will be rewarded. So stay tuned, and I will tell you exactly when I want you to give me, to give me the notes. And I'm going to also have you um, post it in a certain way. So you have to listen because you'll be disqualified if you try to post it too soon. All right. Here's our agenda. This is what we're covering today. Okay. So right off the bat, I'm going to give a very quick introduction to Express Entry. All of you who have watch the previous videos leading up to this live event will have noticed that I did cover a little bit on what Express Entry is previously. So I'm going to zip through that a little bit quicker. All right. Then um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here. Actually, I'm going to flip back. Um, what to do if you can't get a proper reference letter. I'm going to cover that. And I'm also going to cover the essential tips on showing proof of funds. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back. And fortunately, I do have the ability to look at my screen. And I'm going to pull this off because I think it's interfering. So let's jump back to the full screen again. There we go. All right. So first, I'm going to talk about that nasty reference letter. Then we're going to talk about proof of funds because I've had, th I, well, not thousands, but I'm sure collectively over the last few months, Proof of funds is a huge issue. How do you show it? Some of you actually need money to be able to establish yourself in Canada, and the government wants you to do that. So how do you prove it? And there's lots of different questions and issues associated with that. All right. And then at the end, I'm going to give you a tip on how to improve your chances of qualifying if you're not yet eligible. All right? So, and basically increasing your comprehensive ranking system scores. Now, this is going to be a little bit off there. Some, a lot of you people may not even understand um, some of this lingo, but if you have been an Express Entry Law Facebook group member for a while, you will. All right, so let's get to it. Who am I? This crazy character, Mark Holthy, who am I? Well, here we go. I am a Southern Alberta farm boy. You can see on the left there, my mother loved to dress us in our cowboy shirts. That's me with the circle around me. And then on the right, you can see I have my 4-H calf. And that is basically a calf that I raised from little all the way to big. And then we had this show at the end of the year. So that's my calf named Tag. So there he is, the white Charlet calf. I also was an athlete. I love sports. 
You can see me here. This is at the Western Canada Games. High jump was my event. And my personal best when I was actually um, actively competing was a little over six foot nine, so about two meters and five centimeters, which in comparison to the Olympic athletes is not super high. But considering I am about five foot 11, I was pretty happy with my abilities to high jump. Anyway, so I was an athlete. And, and, I, and because of that jump 205, I was able to go to the Barcelona Olympic Trials. So for Canada, all these high jumpers, and I'm the little guy on the end, and uh, we had, I had the ability to go to Montreal, my first plane ride, um, to compete in the Olympic Trials for Canada. So that was a huge passion, absolute passion. But then I also played volleyball. I was the captain of my volleyball team, and that's probably a good reason why I'm coaching to this day. But I played at our local community college, and that was an awesome experience. And all of that led to me becoming a teacher. And in fact, I wanted to be a phys ed teacher. So this is actually one of my first little lessons that I taught as I was going through school on volleyball. How ironic, isn't it? So high school teacher, athlete, farm kid, I'm just your average, average Joe. Nothing special about me. Until I started having a family and I realized that I needed to be going to a different direction, and that direction was law. So this is me at the beginning of, I think it was my first year at the Faculty of Law, the University of Manitoba. And during the summer, and this is the final piece here, I worked as a Canadian immigration officer. And I actually worked right there, Chief Mountain Border Crossing. And ironically, that fire that swept through Waterton just about took out Chief Mountain. And so that little spot there, right where that stop sign is, to the right of it, I was in that little office. And that's where I worked um, a lot of the summer as an immigration officer. And there's me with my nice little badge. And that's what got me into this whole gig, doing this stuff. All right. Then this was a happy day for me. This is when I was sworn in, sworn in as a lawyer. Um, and there's my principal, the lawyer who supervised my articles, and there's my family. Now, you look at it, we're actually missing a member of the family, and that's Michaela. <laughs> but some of you who've been on our Express Entry Law Group have seen, that, seen her and some of the pictures that I posted of her. But all those kids are big now. And then on the left, there's, there's me and my mother. Here's the crew. There's Michaela. There's Connor, Jessica, my son Adam at the back, and then me and my wife. And folks, this is why I became a lawyer. This is why I love doing what I'm doing. All right. What else has happened in my life? Well, so who am I? Like, who cares? Why would you even listen to me? Well, the reality is I'm a frequent speaker on Canadian immigration. I have presented at a number of different locations. I teach sessional classes at university. Um, I'm a member of the, the Law Society of Alberta, and I have run the legal education uh, immigration seminars for lawyers for the past, oh, I don't know, eight years, nine years. And um, I presented at a number of different conferences, colleges, universities. I teach lawyers. I teach consultants all about uh, express entry and immigration. And that is, uh, to a large extent, um, what drives my ship. I love teaching. And I couldn't let go of the, the teacher in me. And I'm frequently featured on, in the news and um, in, uh, on, on TV at, on occasions and print media. So that's the story. And the thing that I actually appreciate most is right there in the beginning, uh, right there in the middle, I should say, who's who legal. That little logo there, I'm rec recognized as one of the world's um, leading business immigration lawyers. And I take that that honor very, very seriously because it's voted on by my peers. And then, of course, I'm a member of all of these organizations as well. Law Society of Alberta, Canadian Bar Association, and the American Immigration Lawyers Association. So this is me rattling off a bunch about me. Enough. <laughs> Enough about me. You guys get the picture. This stuff is, is something I've got a passion for. And I love doing this. I love teaching people. And so right off the bat, let's zip through for those who are just tuning in and may be unfamiliar what this whole process is. Well, what is express entry? Well, it is the primary way for skilled workers to immigrate to Canada. And express entry isn't a program in itself, but it's the way that Citizenship and Immigration Canada, or as we now call them, 
Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada manages the various economic immigration programs. And you can see them here. The Canadian Experience Class, the Federal Skilled Worker, Federal Skilled Trade, and some of the Provincial Nominee Programs, but not the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program where I am a part of. So it's all designed to fast-track PR. And it's designed to allow IRCC to select the best candidates for the labor market. So how does it work? Well, you put your profile, as long as you meet the minimum entry criteria, you enter your profile into the express entry pool along with everybody else, and you are ranked against them. Those, every two to three weeks, who have the highest ranking or above whatever the pass mark is, are given an invitation to apply. So you receive an ITA, and then you have three months to actually submit the permanent resident application. The government says within six months we will process or approve 80% of these applications. So can you see this? See how fast this is? It's lightning fast. And so that's what Express Entry is. It's designed to get permanent residence for people quick. <clears throat> now, what is this all about? How does it work? Well, there are points allocated to each candidate when they're in the pool. And it's based on their human capital. So your age, language, education, and Canadian work experience. Then the government throws in these transferability factors where they mesh up different combinations. If you've got high foreign, high language skills and, and good at education, then you'll get bonus points. And so you can get a total of up to 600 under the human capital uh, category. And then there's a whack of additional points you can get. And you can see here, if you've got family, in particular brothers or sisters in Canada, if you speak French as well as English, if you have Canadian education, you've gone to school here, and if you have arranged employment. So if you have a Canadian employer who's offering you a job and supporting your permanent residence, you can get extra points for all of those. So you can see it's all out of a total of 1,200 points. And if you are a single individual, this is the breakdown of those points on the left column you can see here. A total of 500 if you're single. If you're married, ironically, you're somewhat prejudiced because 40 of your 500 points are actually attributed to your spouse. And you can see spouse will get 10 points attributed for their education, 20 for language, and 10 for the Canadian work experience. Okay, so you guys get it, I think, how it works. So if I go back, you can see if you're single, all the points are attributed to you. If you're married, the problem is if your spouse does not have good education or good language skills, then you could potentially lose 40 points. But that's the way, that's the, way the government rolls. So that's a quick snapshot of express entry and how it works. Now, you're probably asking these rounds of invitations. Well, if the total is 1,200 points, then what have the scores been? Well, here they are. You can see a breakdown. Now, I did a big jump from, from draw number 22 to draw number 51 at the beginning of this year. But you can see there was a downward trend. In fact, draw number 65 on May the 31st was the lowest draw to date, 413. But before, after that 65th invitation to apply, the government then instituted or they added points for the brothers and sisters and the French. And so we're wondering now, after those additional points are given for people with family in Canada, if those totals are actually going to start to come down again. And you can see that there was a, a bump up to 449, and then it went back down to about 433 on the 69th draw, and most recently 434. But I'll tell you, I was at a conference I remember two years ago, and actually two years ago, our National Canadian Bar Association had a conference in Vancouver, I think it was. Was it Vancouver? Yeah, somewhere. And I was on the panel for Express Entry, and the officer said that the sweet spot for the government, at least where they were shooting, was between 350 and 450. Well, we haven't seen anything down below 400 to this stage. But next year will be the first year where they wipe this slate clean, where most of the permanent resident applications are all processed, and, and we will really see where the scores are going to go. So if you're in that range, 350 to 450, there's still hope for you. All right. The problem is, and this is what I faced, okay, a lot of people will come to me, because I'm the lawyer, because my legal fees are a little bit more expensive, they will come to me and they will 
um, usually wait until something bad has happened. I just had to get a little drink there. They'll wait until the very end. They'll wait until they relied on family or friends or someone to help them do their own application. And then something will go wrong. And then they'll come to me and they'll say, Mark, um, I want to retain you to help me. Well, often at that stage, it's too late and there's nothing I can do. And I'm, I'm just like this guy, although obviously my hair isn't as gray and my beard isn't as gray. But couples come to me all the time with just like that fellow on the right with their hands and their hair, realizing, you know, that there's nothing that I can do for them. And they, you know, they waited and they trusted people that maybe they shouldn't have trusted. And they just went to sources that they couldn't trust. And it's not just them. It's international students like these people who they themselves thought that they could just rely on the Internet. They could just trust um, these online immigration forums or each other and their or other people who submitted their applications before them, who then were very helpfully offering them suggestions. But the problem was just because someone else did something and got it approved doesn't mean that it's going to work all the time. And so all of these people, foreign workers who are here in Canada, who were left with, with no ability to apply for permanent residence, and even international professionals like many of you who have tried to rely on local agents or, or consultants who, you know, to a large extent, don't know any more than you. Maybe they speak English, you know, relatively well, and so you trust them. But then, before you know it, your hopes are dashed. So I went through all of this. Have you guys felt like one of these people? If you have, just post in the comment. Let me know. Have you ever felt like one of these people? Just like you don't know where to turn? Or maybe some of you who have actually relied on people, and when you did it, it resulted in you losing out on an opportunity for permanent residence in Canada. Or you got your application returned and back into the queue. And I can tell you, if you were one of these people, I'm going to jump back here a little bit. If you were one of the people who received a draw with a comprehensive ranking system of 413 points on draw number 65, and then you get your application returned because you trusted uh, an agent overseas or some useless consultant or even a dabbling lawyer, and then you end up like this individual here. Well, just post in the comments if, if you felt like that. All right. So I realized, everyone, that I had to do something about this. I couldn't stand people coming to my office, asking for my help, and then me having to tell them that there was nothing I could do. And as an immigration lawyer, I charge for consultations. But when people come to me and there's nothing I can do to help them, well, I'm not going to charge them. So it started to have a significant impact on my practice because I was doing a lot of consults that ultimately ended up being free. So I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to do something about this. So I started the Canadian Immigration Podcast, and you guys can go to iTunes and you can ask, actually listen to it. I not only did that, but I set up a whole website. And on that website, I started posting blog posts like these ones to help people avoid some of the most common mistakes. What to do when your Canadian visa application is rejected? Well, that was something that I did because I'd get people calling me all the time after their application was refused. Or this one on the right, how to draft an employer reference letter that works. And you can search these. These are available, and if you just <clears throat> type in these titles, I, I can guarantee that you're going to be able to pull these up. And so by doing this, I was able to help, and I am able, even today, thousands of people every day who come to the website. And I help them proactively. Then, within some of my episodes, <clears throat> top five reasons CIC deems you ineligible for express entry. Or, top five reasons your, your express entry application for permanent residence gets rejected. And just to help people avoid the common mistakes. Then, the final piece of the puzzle. And you guys, you're living proof of it right now. I created a private Facebook group, the Express Entry Law Facebook group, and we have over 60,450 members of our private Express Entry Law Facebook group. 
And I created that so that I could answer people's questions because people sent me emails all the time asking me, hey, can you help to assess my qualifications? Or what do I do if I can't get a reference letter that works? Or I'm having trouble with this proof of funds. Do I need to have the funds in my bank account for six months? Questions like this. And so I realized that if people posted questions on the, face, on the Facebook group, then I could answer them and over 60,000 people could benefit from one answer instead of me answering each individual person. Now, people are always sending me private Facebook Messenger questions, and I just don't have the ability to answer them. But the reality is when you have 60,000, over 60,000 people, and I've asked them to post their questions, and I'll try to answer them, guess what, folks? The reality is it's absolutely impossible for me to answer everyone's questions when there's 60,000 people asking them, even if I know that 60,000 people are benefiting from the responses. So it was a huge problem. And once again, I was caught. Me trying to be helpful and then disappointing people. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. I just couldn't keep up with the questions. And you guys know it, especially over the last couple of weeks here. You know, as I've had so many other obligations, it's been impossible for me to keep up and manage my law practice. So I realized something. Some of the questions were very similar. People were asking the same types of questions over and over and over again. And so I realized that, do you know what? Maybe I can do something about this. Now, when it came to specific and confidential questions, and I got a lot of those, I couldn't answer those within the Private Express Entry Law Facebook group. So that was another issue. Lots of people will post very, very personal things. And you can see when people do it because you don't want to be di disclosing your own confidential personal information to the world because 60,000 people are still the world. But the reality is I knew that I needed to do something about it. And so I realized there was a solution for this. There was a solution for the specific questions. <clears throat> but I'm going to hold you guys um, in limbo here. And I'm going to share my answer and my solution a little bit later in this presentation. Now I'm going to grab another quick drink here. Okay, <clears throat> I have done enough rambling. It's time to teach. First thing, right off the bat, essential tips on showing proof of funds. Okay, so people are probably wondering, well, what is this all about? What are these funds? Well, if you are immigrating to Canada and you do not have a job offer from a Canadian company and you are outside of Canada, so you're not going to be going through the Canadian experience class, which is designed for people with Canadian work experience. If those things don't apply to you, then that's really most of the people these days. You can't just arrive in Canada with no money and expect to provide for yourself. So the government requires you to have a certain amount of funds to get yourself established. And it's not a small amount. For example, for one person, if you're immigrating by yourself, you need to have at least $12,300 Canadian available to settle. But some of you may not have that money. So people ask me, well, what do I do? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is, are you even required? And like I said right now, if you are granted an ITA under the Canadian Experience class, or you've got an arranged offer of employment, you don't need to worry about it. So settlement funds are not required. But if that doesn't apply to you, then here's what the government requires. They want you to provide an official letter issued by a financial institution, the one, of course, that holds your bank account. Um, and that letter must list all your bank and investment accounts. And it must list the account numbers the dates each account was opened, and the balance in each account over the past six months. They also want you to state the average over that past six months, and then the current balance right now. So 
That's what the government asks you to provide. Well, that letter also needs to list all of the outstanding debts, such as credit cards and loans, and it must be printed on the letterhead of the financial institution and include your name, the financial institution's contact information, and that is what the government asks you to provide when you're proving your funds. And you can see right here, these are the totals. So if you're a single person, 12300 All the way up to, if there are seven people in your family, 32550 is what you need to provide. These numbers go up and down. So if you're listening to this and this uh, video is old, those numbers may have gone up and changed. And then for each additional family member, $3,314. So that's what you have to prove. Well, some people say, well, I don't have that much money. Well, what if, I, what if I get some money from my family? Will that work? Well, if you're receiving money from family, it has to be irrevocable. It must be a gift that is not a loan. So you can't say, hey, mom, dad, could you loan me some money? Or brother, sister, I'm going to be immigrating to Canada and I'll pay back later. No, it must be an irrevocable gift. And... You have to understand, if your bank account shows a large deposit, well, you're going to have to be able to explain it, especially if that large deposit came from a gift from family or maybe you sold some property to get the money. You sold your home. So if it comes from a f your family members, then you're going to need a statutory declaration from that family member confirming that the gift to you is irrevocable. So pay close attention to this. What you're going to want to put into that statutory declaration, and there's a lot of different terms. Some people call it gift deeds and all kinds of things. But the reality is it's a sworn statement that describes the date and the amount of funds that were transferred, so how much they gave you. I always include the account numbers for you and the family member gifting the money. So where the money is coming, you want to provide the source of it. Then the reference number, if it's a wire transfer or some other transfer. And then once again, within that statutory declaration, you must confirm that it is an irrevocable gift and not a loan. All right? So I think you guys get that. Well, I'm not done. <laughs> Here's some other tips that I want to share with you. Number one, you can use multiple accounts collectively to show that you have sufficient funds. So it doesn't all have to be in the same account. If you have sufficient funds in one account, then don't worry about the other ones. So you only need to provide the account that has sufficient funds in it. However, if you've got debts or other obligations, you do need to disclose those. And so if it reduces the total available funds, well, at this stage, we don't believe that it's going to be a problem, but it could cause problems if the government had any doubt that the funds that you were listing as assets in your account are actually going to be available for the purposes of you settling in Canada. You cannot use property valuations, so it doesn't work. You can't go get your home appraised and then say, here, government, look, my home is worth $100,000 Canadian, and here's the property valuation to prove it. Because property values are so inflated in many countries, they are not accepted as proof of funds for uh, express entry. And you must remember that any funds that are encumbered, in other words, they are tied to some other um, debt that you have, those it just doesn't work. So they must be unencumbered. All right? So there is my helpful tip on proof of funds. Oh, and don't forget, <clears throat> you can't use borrowed funds. So no loans, which I've already stated. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to get another drink here, and then I'm going to show you how to solve the specific question problem. All right. So, it's really difficult for people to understand what's a general question and what's specific. But, IRCC's one-touch policy can be downright 
cruel. And what I mean by that is people have specific questions for me all the time they do. And obviously there's only so many of me to go around. And so often people will try to get answers from all of their friends, all of their families, online, the government website, wherever they can go. But if you make one mistake, one mistake, it can amount to your express entry application being refused and returned to you back into the queue, back into the pool and having to start all over. And in some cases, it can actually be, lead to a finding of misrepresentation if you failed to disclose something that you should have. So there's, it's a whole minefield. And so it's no, no wonder that people have specific questions. The stakes are super high. Like I said, if you make a mistake, it can literally mean the difference between you immigrating to Canada and losing that dream of being here. And many people just can't afford to get it wrong. You have to get it right. So despite what RRCC says about doing it yourself, some people just need a little extra help. And that's why I created the, the Express Entry Law private Facebook group so that we could help one another. And some of the people in that group are amazing. They take so much time to help one another. But the reality is a lot of the advice is very, very general, very surface oriented. In other words, people are basically answering questions based on their experience, which is really good and it's helpful. But sometime a per, sometimes a person's experience may have worked just because of the officer that was adjudicating the application and not because um, it's the exact policy of immigration. And that's what I see happen a lot. People rely on answers that are general in nature or from the experience of someone who did it before them. And then they get a different officer who didn't take the same position and refuses their application. So some people, they just need a little extra help. And so here is, <laughs> before I get to that secret, it is now time. It is time for all of you to go and post a picture of your notes now in the comment section of this live video. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to see if I can pull it up. Just let's see how this works. It's going to be a little crazy, so bear with me. Okay, I'm going to go here to our Facebook page. I'm going to expand this up. And then you can see me blithering on here. I want you guys to post it right here under this live video. Let's just see here. All right. Okay, so post it under our live video. I'm going to shift back here. There we go. So post a picture of your notes. And that is now those who, who and, and Justin, <laughs> my tech guy, um, the, the guy in the background, he is going to review those posts and he is going to choose Justin, a winner. And I'm going to drop this volume off and I'm going to scroll down. All right. So I want you to post a picture of your <laughs> your notes here and Justin at the end of the um, this video he's gonna select the top three note takers and uh, they are going to win three uh, one of three 30-minute legal consultations with me all right now we're jumping ahead Actually, just give me one second. I want to see something here. This is me. It's live. We're enjoying it. Uh, yes. Okay. I'm going to go back to full screen here. Okay. So, <laughs> it was just in a... Um, I had to advance it here to get all of this. So, now, I want to teach you guys again. I want to teach you some more. So what to do when you can't get a proper, ref proper reference letter? Now, this one's going to be a little bit more interactive. And I get this question all the time. When you are applying through Express Entry, there are very specific requirements for proving that foreign work experience. So I'm going to shift back right here to my Chrome. This time, I am going to go to... 
the government website and I'm gonna show you guys something here As soon as it pops up it's gonna be nice and big this here is how I operate I don't just give you little bits and pieces of of uh, my interpretation of what I think the government wants us to do when we're filing express entry applications I actually provide links back to the source and this is one of them this is what the immigration officers use to guide them in determining whether your document is acceptable or not. So let's take a look at proof of work experience. So here's the general rule, guys. Maybe I can make this a little bit larger so everybody watching, looking at this on their handheld can see. So in order for your work experience to be uh, accepted, it must meet these requirements. So if you look here, the following documents, so it has to be um, a reference letter or experience letter from your employer. And this is mandatory, folks. You will not be able to get around it unless you provide it. Or, in the case of my question, what to do if you can't get one, um, I'll show you some alternatives. But you need to prove this in one way or another. So a reference letter or experience letter from the employer. It needs to be an official document printed on company letterhead. And it must include all of this information right here. The, your name, the company's contact information, so their address, telephone number, and email address. And, your, and the name, title, and signature of the immediate supervisor or personnel officer at the company, which is basically your human resource personnel. Okay? So, um, oh, it says here, Claudia says, uh, not able to post a pic of notes because there is no option in the comment section of the live video. Oh. Well, see, there we go. I'm glad that I'm watching you guys' comments. All right, so here's what, um, here's what I want you to do. I want you, um, I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, I'm going to have to notify you guys after the EE Live Q&A is, uh, sorry, after this express entry video is over. I will notify you, but what I'm going to have you guys do is actually... I'm going to go back here to this and I'm going to go back to me here and I'm going to turn this on <laughs> so you can see me. I'm going to post right up here for everybody to see because I can't really do it with my PowerPoint. Right here is my email address. So you can see it right here mholfe at stringham.ca. Take a picture of your notes or email them to me and <clears throat> I can see the date, the timestamp, so it's got to be during the course of this live video. But this is where I want you to send them, okay? To mholfe at stringham.ca and I will stick this one, um, <coughs> excuse me, just up here. Uh, I think that's probably long enough for everyone to see. So send it to mholfe at stringham.ca. That's coming off. And then I'm also going to pull this off just in case it's in the way. I'm not sure if it was before or not. Okay, now we're going back to sharing screens. And I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so back to the reference letter. And actually, I've got to go back to this page that we were on. Okay, I love the hearts flying across there. That is so awesome, guys. Thanks for your support. Okay, so all of that information needs to be on this official document printed on the company letterhead, all right? It also should include all the positions held while employed at the company. And here's the most important part. It must include the following details. So I'm going to highlight these, and you can see. Job title duties and responsibilities, job status, dates worked for the company, number of hours per week, which is often missed, and annual salary and benefits, which is also often not listed on a reference letter. So people are thinking, well, what do I do? What can I possibly do if my letter comes back from my employer and it's deficient? In other words, it doesn't have all of this information. Or worse yet, you're a, a past employer refuses to give you one. 
or the business is closed. Can you imagine all the different possibilities that would prevent you from having a perfect reference letter? Well, right off the bat, I want to tell all of you that IRCC is cruel. They can be downright heartless. So the first thing I'm going to tell you right off the bat is you need to do everything in your power, everything to get a letter that covers all of these things. So I know you've already said I can't get one, I can't get one. Well, you need to do everything in your power to get one. Now, I'm not talking about faking one or getting someone to, you know, to produce a fraudulent document. That's not what I'm talking about here. But if it's a matter of pleading with your employer or an ex-employer, then you do it. Okay, so failing that, what do you do? Well, here's the key. You can see here all of these things that are required. Job title, duties, uh, dates worked, hours per week, salary. <clears throat> First and foremost, you doing a sworn statement, a statutory declaration, or some affidavit saying, hey, I promise I worked at this job at this employer, and I promise these were my hours, and this is my annual salary, it will not cut it. You cannot send in your own attestation to verify that you truly do have the work experience. It won't cut it. So you need to rely on third parties. In other words, if you can't get it from the employer directly, you can't get it, you can't provide it yourself, then you must rely on any other third party or external source to cover off each of these things that are supposed to be included. So, what are some options? Do you have a job offer letter? So for example, do you have the letter when you first accepted the job that might have listed the duties, that might have listed your wage, that might have listed your title? Do you have that? So that's the first thing. Do you have pay stubs that the company issued you? That's a wonderful resource. That's confirmation that you're paid. That's confirmation that you worked for the company as well as the time that you worked. So pay stubs are really good. Do you have old bank statements showing that the company deposited funds into your account? Do you have copies of any of your deposit slips if checks were issued? Do you have any check stubs? Do you see what I'm getting at here? This could be as broad and as wide as your imagination could take you. Do you have annual tax filings? In Canada, um, employers have to issue a T4 showing how much um, money was paid and the taxes that were paid on behalf and remitted to the government for every employee. Those are issued on an annual basis. So in the U.S., it's a W-2. In Canada, it's a T4. Do you have something like that in your country? Some of you are probably saying, my employer paid me in cash. Well, you have to understand that if you can't document all of these things here, then IRCC, remember, they're cruel. And if you can't get them, it's entirely possible an officer will say, sorry, I'm not approving this. All right, what else? Well, now let's look to people. Do you have a coworker that you worked with that, that could vouch or provide an affidavit swearing to what you did or a statutory declaration? Do you have a supervisor that's still with the company that would be willing to do it in their personal capacity? Do you have proof from the company, and I would always include it, saying, no, we won't do it. <laughs> no, we won't provide a letter. Or, sorry, we don't, our, our letters come in this format and we will not add hours of work or salary or benefits. So look to other people who know you who know the job you did, that you could possibly get to provide um, an affidavit or some form of statutory declaration attesting to the work that you actually did. So folks, it's, a, it's as broad as you could possibly imagine. You just have to be creative. But the key is you need to find something as a third-party document or an external source of some form that can satisfy each of these things. All right? So... There is no magic list. It all depends on your unique circumstances, but you need to find and think creatively about things that you can do 
to satisfy each of these elements that must be included in the letter. All right? So there we go. All right, now we're going to shift back to the PowerPoint presentation. Ta-da! This here is my solution, folks. Some of you are probably saying, Mark, Mark, are you serious? You're now bringing this up as your solution to every evil out there in the world. <laughs> well, it's maybe not exactly evil, but your solution to not being able to answer all of our questions all the time. And folks, I want you to understand how much I appreciate all of you. If I did not have a day job, if I did not have my family with four children, one daughter in university, a son who's just recently graduated from high school, who's preparing to go serve a mission, a two-year mission for our church, um, two younger ones in high school and middle school, and a loving wife who supports me unendingly. If I didn't have them to provide for, I would do this all day. This would be my retirement plan. A free Facebook express entry law page where all I did all day was answer people's questions. But at this stage, it's just not feasible. So I created this. And some of you know I created it because I beta tested the first version with all of you guys. I offered it for basically next to nothing. And I used you guys, all of your questions, all of your tips, uh, well, I should say your, your feedback on the course to make it what it is today on this launch. And this express entry, complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself, is exactly this, folks. It's like, I don't know if you've ever played um, a video game that's a role-playing game, where you have to go through and advance through these different challenges in order to finish the game. Well, that's the only way I can describe it. But you don't want to really do it because it takes so long to make all the mistakes and to search under every rock and to, you know, to explore through this adventure trying to, you know, be the knight that saves the princess at the end of the game. So these games can take hours and hours, days, weeks, months to complete. But then there's the lovely guy who goes in and does it themselves first and then posts on their internet page, on their internet website or online social media or on YouTube a complete walkthrough of how you do it. And so you can zip through and still experience everything, but you just follow this step-by-step -step process. Well, everyone, that's exactly what I created with this. I took this and I created it so simple that my 12-year-old daughter would be able to follow it and apply for her own express entry. I honestly believe that. And so those of you who maybe struggle with the language a little bit or maybe are just not tech savvy and just are really struggling with understanding how to submit your own application, your own express entry profile, and completing your EAPR, I created this step-by-step -step guide to maximizing your chance of getting your express entry application approved. So I created this for you. I created it for all those people who wouldn't normally come to me but would only come after they screwed everything up and wanted me to save them. Well, I can't save you. But this is what I did. <coughs> so I created this guide to provide something that was at a lower price point, but still contained all of my knowledge, all of my experience, everything that I poured into it. So some of you are asking, well, what are the benefits? Like, why should I do this? Well, you have access to a resource you can trust versus taking your chances with the Internet. And right off the bat, you guys know what I'm talking about. There's 5,000 other express entry private Facebook pages. And some of the people who've started those pages um, jumped on my site as well and then decided to open their own, right? Who you know nothing about them. You know nothing about their backgrounds. Maybe they're just someone who's done it themselves and figures that they're the experts. But the reality is that's simply a risky proposition. And so I've created something here that you guys can trust. Second, significant time savings. You know what it's like? I've talked to you guys. You spend hundreds of hours, some of you, hundreds, figuring out what you need to do, researching questions, <clears throat> going online, 
asking questions on Facebook groups, trying to puzzle your way through, going to the government website, and you waste so much time. Well, some people have got time to burn and they don't care. But others, for just a few dollars Canadian a month, you can have a direct walkthrough of the whole process, saving you, literally, you could probably do it in a couple hours. I'm serious, if you had everything together. That's how efficient this process is. And finally, like I alluded to, dollars. In fact, thousands of dollars in representative fees. I'm slowly starting to understand, especially Asia Pacific, what some of these agents, some are illegal, some are not even authorized to help you, but I'm now starting to understand what they charge, or even consultants, or dabbling lawyers for that matter. And I can tell you that just by doing it yourself, with a little help from me, and the express entry step-by-step guide to doing it yourself, you guys can save thousands and thousands of dollars. So, what are the three? Number one, it's a resource you can trust. And you guys know me. The 60,000 people on the Express Entry Law Facebook group, you know me. I don't just throw out answers, but I provide this source repeatedly. You can save significant time and save thousands of dollars in rep fees. But you know what? Don't listen to me. I asked some of the people who have already purchased the course to share their thoughts. And I didn't tell them, I told them not to script it. I said, speak from your heart, and if it sucks, you tell me. But I want you guys to give me, if you're willing, a video testimonial of whether or not you think this, this express entry, step-by-step guide to doing it yourself is actually worth it. So, folks, have a listen. All right, there you have it. Now, I I think Sunita said that you couldn't hear very well, and that's the story of my life. (laughs) The reality is, excuse me, the reality is there's going to be some technical glitches, and I was trying to figure out ways to be able to share this with you so that you guys could hear it well. When I turned the mic to the, I turned the mic around at the end of it, and um, I, uh, after I turned the mic to it, did that help to increase the sound? So, Sunita, because this is important. This dentist from India, um, Arashma, she's awesome. And she used my guide, and she was the first one that was willing to step up and provide me with a video testimonial. And remember, these, these guys not only paid for the course, but were willing to do this without any, um, you know, without, without getting anything in return from, from me. Now, for many of them, I offered to give them a free consult if they uh, were willing to, to share their thoughts. But at the end of the day, these guys, um, uh, the testimonials that they share are their real-life experience using the course. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so Sandy says, I had to turn it up, but I could hear it. I did see your clip the other day, though, so it's okay. All right. And some of you, I'm going to post these clips as well so that you can watch them again. 
but I didn't want you guys just to hear me talking about my own course and uh, extolling how awesome it is without <clears throat> actually taking the time to share real live you know users of the guide all right next thing I want to tell you is that there is a 100% money back guarantee 100% if you guys go on there and you start using it and and you say man this thing sucks then well one right off the bat I want you to give me feedback so that I can fix whatever aspects of it that you feel suck but there is a 100% 30 day money back guarantee so there's really absolutely no risk to all of you guys and um, uh, when you when you purchase the 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 course all right <clears throat> I have something else for you take a look at this I charge five thousand dollars Canadian in legal fees and I know that there are consultants overseas outside of Canada and other consultants and lawyers in Canada that charge even more than that some charge less but on average that's the cost of hiring an immigration lawyer to represent you fully reviewing only of the entire express entry process I charge 2500 Canadian that's if you do most of the work yourself and then you have me review it that's what I charge then if you are booking a formal legal consultation with me I charge four hundred dollars Canadian for one hour of my time and that's because of what my law firm expects that's what they bill me out as four hundred dollars Canadian and many 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 of you out there have book consultations I do them with you guys all the time so it's about two hundred dollars plus five percent GST for a 30-minute consult so that's what you winners of the note-taking uh, group that's what you guys <clears throat> whoever took the best notes you're gonna get a free 30-minute consult which is really a value of about two hundred and ten dollars Canadian but that's the price guys that's what you're gonna pay when you retain me I love acting for you I love being your lawyer I love being your full representative and I would encourage anyone who want just complete peace of mind to hire me yes or to hire me to do a review and at times I do offer discounts as well for reviews and full applications to our Express Entry Law Facebook group members but when it comes to um, uh, this what I have right now folks this is what I am offering for all of you so lifetime access and many 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 of you were asking all right what um, I had a payment plan just a monthly payment plan that I had set up before for it was like thirty nine dollars it was like cheap as cheap and now many people have asked me about lifetime and I know that many of you are immigration consultants and lawyers who also subscribe and um, that use the guide and I, I consider that flattery I love it when you do that and I will um, share with all of you who are interested and you just need to you just need to private message me or you can send a, an email to my email address or whatever I have set up an affiliate program for all of you consultants or whoever if you have someone that you want to refer to take the course <clears throat> excuse me even um, family or friends who could benefit from it if they uh, purchase the lifetime access of the course then you will get a portion of that money that was that was paid so that's how affiliates work but I knew that for lots of people it would be a little tricky so four hundred ninety seven dollars some of you in your country can't even uh, make payments that large on your credit cards and so we set up some options for you our payment plan is essentially six payments of eighty seven dollars a month which r rounds up roughly to the four hundred ninety seven dollars but some of you will just want to jump in for a short period of time so you will just want to jump in for a monthly subscription no strings attached and the payment plan I should have put there is for six so that's six payments of eighty seven dollars to get to the lifetime access that's what you're getting with the payment plan but some of you just want a couple months you only want to jump in and then jump out <coughs> and so <coughs> excuse me so the, for one month access it's going to be ninety seven dollars all right and so <coughs> excuse me that is the cost and you can do the evaluation you can see I'm just gonna grab a quick drink <coughs> 
All right, I'm back. But I have something that I want to share with you guys. And because you guys are all here, you're watching live, I have a special offer for all of you. And the offer is going to last for seven days after the conclusion of this live video. But I'm offering 50% off the regular price. So that is 50% off of the 497, 50% off of the 87. 50% off? No, it's not actually. <laughs> the monthly subscription doesn't have a discount because it is just monthly. But when you purchase the lifetime access and, or you choose the payment plan option, then you will be able to benefit from the 50% off. So that is a huge savings to all of you guys. And it's only going to be for the seven days and then it's going to close. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I will provide to you the access to it. And Justin actually is going to post the link where you can uh, click on in the comment section <clears throat> and actually um, uh, click on and subscribe right now for it. Now, with that being said, I'm done talking and I want you to listen to another one of my Express Entry subscribers. I have only recently started using the Express Entry step-by-step -step guide and I have to say it has been a great assistance. Um, even though the IRCC website has a great deal of information, in this guide that Mark has put together, he addresses some of the most commonly asked questions. He fills in the blank, so to speak. And as a person who likes to be 150% sure of what she's doing, I have to say, the guide has provided me with the reassurance that I needed to make sure that I'm going um, through all the steps correctly, that I'm addressing the process the right way. So my recommendation to you is use it. It is a great tool and it will definitely help you. Awesome. So there you go. Hopefully you guys could hear that one a little bit better. <clears throat> the one message that I got from this fine subscriber uh, in Colombia is peace of mind. So the reason she bought it was because she wanted to have peace of mind in knowing that the way she completed her profile, the way she completed her EAPR, her electronic application for permanent residence, that it was actually going to work, that she wasn't going to miss something. And that, for her, was the value of the course. All right. I'm not done teaching you guys. I'm going to give you one last special bonus. And uh, these right now are my top five things to do to increase your comprehensive ranking system score and to increase your chance of success. So I'll consider this my special bonus because we're kind of into overtime now. But you know what? I can't help it. I love teaching you guys. And so every opportunity I can, I'm going to continue to do that. So here's my top five list. Number one, improve your English language scores. Now, I'm going to jump back and forth here. You will see here, and we'll treat the married. We'll go with the married one. But you can see that for language, you can get up to 150 points. But not just 150 points. If you look down to to point number four, transferability, there's up to 100 extra points that are up for grabs if you have a high enough Canadian language benchmark. So in, in, there is a minimum Canadian language benchmark of, five, of sorry seven for most of you overseas. In order to be able to qualify to be eligible for express entry, you need to have at least a CLB level seven in all of the four abilities, reading, writing, speaking, listening. It's not an average, it's at that seven level. Well, if you are at that level and you find that your comprehensive ranking score is, is just too low, it's under 400, one of the best ways that you could ever increase your total points is to rewrite the test. So if it's the IELTS, study and rewrite it. If you can bump it up to a level nine, which is not easy, folks, it will astronomically increase your chances of success. 
Okay, the next thing is improving your education. So you can see here too, there's 140 points if you're married that's up for grabs if you have high education. So the question becomes, most people have bachelor's degrees. But if you could go one more year and get a master's, then that may just be enough to push you over the edge to get extra points and even possibility a PhD. But if you can maximize your education, then that also is another possibility. Now I want to state right here that improving your education is always a challenge because it takes time. And if we go back here, right at the top, the next highest is age. So there's a certain sweet spot. And once you pass that sweet spot in age, which is right around 30, every year that you age and that age increases, you lose points. So after you reach the age of right around 30, you start to lose points every year that you um, age. And so obviously, if you are taking additional education, your education points are going to increase, but your age will decrease if you're over 30. So you need to balance it out. You need to take a close look at the points you're actually getting for your education to determine if it's worth it. But that is another way that you can do it. Okay, the third one, which now is actually really tough, is to secure a job offer from a Canadian company. So if you can actually get a Canadian company to offer you a job, and there's a very specific way that they do it, they have to obtain a labor market impact assessment, and that has to show that there's no Canadian or permanent resident to do your job before they can offer it to you. Um, if they can do that, then great. There's also uh, points for job offers for people who are actually working in Canada who have come in on an employer-specific work permit under an international agreement like NAFTA with our American and Mexican um, uh, foreign nationals or an intercompany transfer. <clears throat> if someone comes from another country and transfers internally between their multinational company, there's extra points for those. And they, they can claim points for a job offer. But that's another way to increase your, your score. And if you look here, <coughs> excuse me, on the right side, arranged employment, if your position is an executive level or senior managerial, oh my goodness, I am just, I just stopped. And I know this is a little unorthodox, but I want to show you guys something. I'm not sure if you can see it. I know I'm so dramatic, but I've got to show you this. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to sh go back here. I'm going to turn my light on. Maybe the light, I shouldn't turn it on. But I want to show you something. I don't know if you guys can see it. I guess you can't. <laughs> I guess you can't. But I wanted to. Sh I wanted to show. I don't think you could hear it either. But you guys didn't. Do you know what that is? It's rain. <laughs> it is rain. Rain that is going to put out those forest fires. And all of you out there who said a little prayer, um, asking for it to rain, your prayers have been answered, and mine have as well. I am so excited. I am so sorry, you guys. <laughs> I am so excited. That is so fantastic. Anyways, I'm sorry for that little distraction. Those who are watching this as a recording are going to think that I'm crazy. And that's fair. I, I am pretty crazy. But hey, this is me. This is live. And I am super excited. I can't believe the rain is coming down. That is so awesome. Yes, he is, Tamal. God is great. All right. I'm sorry. I'm going to get back on track here, but I couldn't believe it. I could hear it hitting, <clears throat> I could hear it hitting the window out there. <clears throat> All right. Let's get back in. Uh, Claudia, it doesn't rain on the south side. 
All right. Okay, we're back. So now to get back to what I was trying to, to teach all of you about. Um, so what I was talking about is uh, the work experience. So the, the arranged employment in Canada. So if you are a senior executive level, uh, if the offer is for a senior executive level position, you can get up to 200 comprehensive ranking system points if you have a job offer. If it's every other regular job offer, then it's 50 points. But folks, that can make, excuse me, the difference between getting an invitation to apply and not. So that's how important that job offer is. And the Canadian economy is a little slow right now. So there isn't as many jobs out there. And so, you know, if it picks up, there's going to be more opportunities. But right now it is kind of tough. All right. Number four, consider coming to Canada and studying and then transition to a work permit and get Canadian work experience. And so if we jump back here, you can see under point two on the left column, you can earn up to 70 extra points for Canadian work experience. But before you get there, if you look on the right side, you can get, if you've completed one to two years of a Canadian educational credential, you can get up to 15 more points. If it's a three or more year degree, for example, you can get up to 30. So if you can get a study permit, you come study in Canada, get those extra points for completing your studies, then you work and you can get extra points for Canadian work experience. Now, don't be deceived, as a post-grad student, on an open work permit, you can't get arranged employment points. Only if your work permit is employer-specific. Now, your employer could love you and decide to get a labor market impact assessment to support your job offer, and then you would be eligible for those 50 points, or in rare circumstances, 200, if you were just a really intelligent person who got a senior executive level position. But the reality is, um, oh, I haven't transferred back to the screen. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. All right, let's try this again here. Uh, I need to transfer back to the screen. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay, I think I'm good now. I'm laughing here. You guys are so patient, and I'm so grateful that I've got... Um... Okay, Justin is like... Hey, where's the PowerPoint? Everybody is saying that you need to change back to the screen. Uh, okay, I need a full tech team to help me with this. I really do. I appreciate you guys being so patient. <laughs> Sandy says, uh, I mean, you have a nice forehead and all, but thought you should know. Yeah, you guys rule. Okay, we are, I think, <laughs> here, I, here I, you've been looking at my forehead. That is so frustrating. All right, you guys are living it. It's all good. Justin says it's still not switched. Okay, what the heck is going on here? Okay, I'm going back here. Ah, oh, man alive. Okay, I'm in business. Now I know it's officially switched. All right, thanks for your patience. Okay, basically, as I was saying, I'm going to go back here. So securing the job offer, that's where I was at. Okay, we're back and we're, I can see now we're functioning properly. Um, so as I said, securing the job offer is, is really important. And I told you about those points. But studying in Canada and then getting a work permit after you're completed is the way that you go. So if I go back here, you'll see if you study in Canada, like I said before, and you look at point five under the additional points on the right side of the slide, you can get up to 15 extra points if you're one to two years of Canadian education, you've completed that credential, and up to 30 points if you have gone three years or more um, completing an educational degree through one of the educational institutions in Canada. Once you complete your studies, then you can get an open work permit. That's one of the benefits of, of studying in Canada. And you can get it for up to three years, um, depending on how long you went to school. And so then you can accumulate Canadian work experience. So I'll tell you, if you're, a foreign inter or if you're an international student in Canada, you have got a significantly great chance of being able to immigrate with those points. So the, the reality is that is number four. Now, number five 
This is not something that I am, I am listing lightly, okay? And some people are looking at this thinking, what the heck? Consider listing your spouse as non-accompanying? Okay, well, let me show you what I mean by this. <clears throat> and this is not something that I would ever advocate anyone does. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but it is something that some people have to consider. If your spouse has low education, language, and Canadian work experience, you're essentially losing 40 points as a principal applicant. So some people realize that, you know what, <clears throat> it's going to take me time to settle in Canada anyways. And so because of that, maybe it makes sense for me to actually come first and then sponsor my spouse after I become a permanent resident. And one of the ways that you, well, right now, as you land as a permanent resident and then sponsor your spouse after, it usually takes about a year to do a spousal sponsorship. But that spouse, if you choose to go down that road, in order to reclaim those extra 40 points you see there at point three on the slide, if your spouse is not accompanying, <clears throat> then they are not assessed. And so those 40 total points attributed to the spouse factors are going to go back to you as a principal applicant, and you're assessed as if you're, as if you're single. And so this is what I wanted all of you to understand. It is a significant advantage if you're one of those people who are sitting at 400 points and you know that you're not going to be able to increase it. This might be one way to consider doing it. And so once you land, you can then sponsor. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, is there anything I can do to um, not have to wait so long to be apart from my spouse? <clears throat> well, the reality is, and this could change at any time, the last discussions that I had, at least with immigration uh, officials, there is a loophole, which I hate using it. And I'll tell you, I, I would never, ever advise one of my clients to do this. But after you have filed your electronic application for permanent residence, it's been submitted. And, and before that, before you fully disclosed your spouse, you've listed them as non-accompanying, they have been medically examined. They have received their, they've submitted their police clearances. They've done everything they need to do, but you list them as non-accompanying. After you've submitted your electronic application for permanent residence and it has been accepted and passed the completeness check stage, you then can notify immigration that your spouse now wants to come. But listen. I never ever, and I say this over and over again, I would never ever advise someone to do it. But because people out there are talking and recommending different suggestions, if this is something that you plan on doing, you need to make sure that you have a very, very good reason as to why your spouse is now coming when right at the beginning, only a few months before, you had listed them as non-accompanying. All right? So there is a way to add your spouse on to, and really, if you have children, your family, before you actually land as a permanent resident. But under no circumstance do you ever, ever, ever not disclose your spouse at all. Because if you do, you could then be subject to a bar. And basically what that means is you are stopped from ever sponsoring them under the family class again in the future if they were not examined properly. So that is my list right here. Considering listing your spouse as non-accompanying is the last one on the list. And those are the tips and suggestions that I've got for increasing your score if you do not yet have a high enough score. All right? That's the bonus, folks. All for you guys because you're awesome. Okay, here's the link. And I'm sure Justin is probably getting this bad boy posted. This is the special 50% launch link, and it's up there. So if you go to this link, it will take you right to the place where you can, um, you can subscribe for the guide right now. Remember, this is going to be open for seven days at 50% off for all of you, and then after, I am going to be re re uh, returning it back to its new regular price, just like we have showed you. But before we do that, I have one last one that I want to show you. 
One last testimonial. And this one is awesome as well. She actually tried to do it a little bit more high end, but let's see. I want to make sure you guys can hear it. for an international organization focusing on security issues. Uh, the decision to purchase the step-by-step -step video guide by Mark Hoff, it came to me as I started facing difficulties when filling out the application for Express Entry System. I had many questions related to how to navigate the system, how to fill in the documents, and what documents to submit. Uh, now I'm still going through the uh, I'm, I'm still going through the process of applying to the Express Entry system. It has been two months since I've been using the step-by-step -step video guide by Mark Hoff, and it has been great help for me. It is really guiding me through the whole application process and giving answers to specific questions that I didn't know where to search for, and these answers. I found on Express Entry, not the CAC official sources. Uh, what I really like about the Express Entry step-by-step uh, -step video guide is that it is very thorough, very detailed, and uh, it will provide you more than with more than enough information for you to successfully complete the uh, your your profile and to successfully apply. The frequently asked uh, question session will also help you to uh, will also offer you a range of solutions to some long-standing situations and difficult cases and that you might find useful as well. If you are facing the same difficulties as I did at, at my time, I definitely recommend you to purchase the step-by-step -step video guide by Mark Hoffman. All right, there we go. So you're probably wondering, why did I choose these particular individuals? Because I had others that I could have chose from. Well, look at their geographic regions. The first dentist was from India. <clears throat> then we had one of the subscribers who lived in South America. Then the final one here in Eastern Europe. So this guide works no matter where you are in the whole world. And the thing I love most about it is because of this, I have been able to act and, and help people all over this globe, which I can tell you makes me super stoked. All right. So here we go, folks. <clears throat> There's the link. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you register within seven days of the live event, you're going to save 50%. All right. So the Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. There's the testimonials. You guys have heard about it. It is open for you. I created it for all of you guys. And so if you want, remember, lifetime access is regular $497 Canadian. You will get it 50% off if you subscribe within the next seven days of this live event. All right. And Justin's been posting the links and uh, he's also been posting um, where you can watch the videos uh, live. So go to the comment section and uh, find Justin Holiday's comment posts. And there are links where you can listen and, um, and watch the, lo the, the video testimonials yourself. All right? Okay. I think, yes. Now... It is time because all of you guys are so awesome. I'm going to jump back here and go full screen. Sweet. Turn on my light because it blinds me. It was so good when I, when I was doing these um, during, like, the, the, it's getting darker earlier here in Canada. That's what it does. And so as I was doing this, um, uh, during this time, usually... It was light out, and the windows in this office are awesome. They are so awesome. And so um, the lighting was just perfect. But now I've got to do all these different contraptions when it's dark out to make it visible for everyone. But uh, Sandy asks, is it still raining? 
Absolutely. Oh my goodness. And do you know what I just realized? I rode my bike to work today. <laughs> oh my goodness. I feel like some high school kid, especially these stupid braces. That was another discussion. Uh, I know some of you in the past, my last EE Live Q&A, uh, I lamented the fact that I had to get these braces on. But hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm learning how to talk and it's not injuring me too badly. Anyways, you guys are awesome. I appreciate everybody that's hung in there for so long. So now, even though it is about 9.15 Mountain Standard Time, it's pitch black outside. I'm going to have to get on my bike and ride home in the dark. Fortunately, there's street lights, and uh, not, too people, not too many people are out there looking to, to uh, mug me when I'm riding by on my bike when it's raining outside, but it's going to be heaven. Feeling the water splashing up on me from the tires, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see all those fires out. But for those of you who have been kind enough to stick around, and it's kind of funny, I even got, boy, I've got all this stuff here. Um, those of you who have been kind enough to stick around, I am going to um, take the next half hour at least and just answer your questions. If you have questions about the course or if you have questions just about Express Entry in general, um, just fire away and let's have fun. So you can post them now. So Ahmed says, great to see you live. You bet, Ahmed. It's awesome to have you here. Um, Sandy says, I'll be sharing the link to a couple people I really think will purchase it. Hey, that's awesome. And I'll tell you guys, I don't, I don't want to push anything that I don't believe in. And given the legal fees that I charge, I love it when you hire me. I love it. I love fully representing you, walking you through the whole process, taking everything off of your hands so you don't have to stress about everything. In fact, I'm the one who's stressing about it to make sure it's correct. But for those of you who are in other countries where your dollar doesn't go as far, you guys, I've created it for you. It's at a price point that's affordable. And I'll tell you, this guide is going to teach you how to do it in a way your consultants will never understand. So <clears throat> I'm going to stop these feeds here quickly so I can keep up to them. All right, so let's go to the first question. Sandy, who's been so patient. <clears throat> okay, my partner has um, BA honors, which was three years, and a master's, which was one year. Am I right in saying that his master's would simply be considered the fourth year to his degree because Canada don't value three-year degrees and one-year master's? Do you know what, Sandy? You are actually wrong. If your degree, it depends on where it's from, okay? And ultimately, you're going to go, <clears throat> excuse me, Ultimately, you're going to go and get it assessed by one of the educational credential assessment agencies. But it is entirely possible that it could be considered the equivalent of a three-year degree plus another degree <clears throat> of one, one or more years. So it could be considered two degrees, or it could actually be considered um, a master's, right? Because you're going to get points for a master's level degree. And um, if it's accepted as that, then great. It just depends on where the, the education was taken. But I have seen times when people had uh, programs that were condensed, that were completed in a shorter period of time, but they still equated to a full bachelor's degree in Canada. So the only way you're going to know, uh, Sandy, is to just go ahead and get those, excuse me, educational credentials assessed. Okay. Great question. Okay, uh, Deval says, one of my friends from India has received the, oh, the, the notice of interest, uh, notification of interest from the OINP. Currently, the OINP e-filing portal seems to close and not accepting new applications. But when is it expected to reopen? Particularly under human capital priority stream. Yes, Deval, I hate, I hate the PNPs. I hate them because you can never trust them. Even though there's been a, a notification or a, of interest, that expression of interest, it doesn't mean that you can apply. And um, if your points are above a certain level within Express Entry, everybody gets them. So guess what happens? Everybody applies. And then guess what happens? Their limited quota, so they only have so many. I'm not sure if it's at 5,500 or if it's increased. But there's only a limited quota each year that they have to, to give out. And that doesn't even count 
the actual human capital priority stream. So there's even a smaller number of that pie that are going to be um, open for submitting nomination applications. So I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. And I'm sure even my colleagues in Ontario don't know. They keep it really tight-lipped. So the only thing you can do is to have all your documents, everything ready from the moment it's opened so you can get everything in as quick as possible and beat everybody else into the queue. And that's the same for Nova Scotia. It's the same for Saskatchewan. It's the same for all those provinces where you can have the potential of immigrating directly to that province without having an employer or a job offer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so let's scroll down here. Lots of thumbs up from Tassawar, um, uh, Tassawar sorry, and Howard. Um, Sandy's giving me a thumbs up. Uh, reliable website to check CRS. Okay, obviously within my guide, I show all of this. But let's see what we got here. I'm going to pull up. Um, I'm going to shrink this down. Okay, I can do this. I can do this, folks. I'm going to figure out how to do this without messing up S full screen and switch here okay CRS here's how you find it just go CRS tool CIC because it's still the government's website is still CIC okay this is it it's the comprehensive ranking system tool skilled immigrants right here okay and um, I don't know Justin maybe can try to post that link but if you just type in comprehensive uh, CRS tool actually it will take you here and then you can assess it so you don't need to go to someone else's website and you know who you are with um, that has um, their own express entry calculator you don't need to worry about that all you need to do is go to that website and you are good to go all right so I'm gonna jump back so that's where it is okay next question um, Vipul says, about my wife, can I make change in application after submission? Okay, well, as I said before, you had better indicate your spouse is, um, and that you are married when you submit your application. Sometimes people will get married partway through the process after they've submitted their application, even after they've submitted their electronic application for permanent residence. So they've submitted their profile, they've then got an ITA, and then they've submitted their electronic application for permanent residence. Then after that's in the queue, then what happens is they get married. Well, you do not want to fail to disclose that. You must, in fact. So yes, you are going to upload to the case-specific inquiry with all of your details, your, your express entry file number, your, um, if you have one, your unique client identification number, and you're going to say, I have a spouse, I just got married, I want him or her added. That's what you do. So absolutely, you are going to make that change, okay? And you can, if, well, while your application is in, in, the, uh, in the pool, you've just submitted your profile, you haven't yet received an ITA, uh, you can always go back and make changes. There's no problem. But after you get your ITA and then you submit your EAPR, that's when you got a whole host of problems. And in past EE live Q&As that I've done, we've talked about that. But I'm not going to get into specific details about what changes after applying, um, submitting your EAPR will hurt you and which changes won't. I'm not going to get into that right now because it's, it's a whole video in itself. Um, Rohit says, can I change spouse not accompanying? If yes, please share how because I'm not able to do so. Well, what happens is... Um, Wow, Rohit. Do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna create a separate video just for that, okay? I'm gonna do I'm gonna show you guys in the next EE Live QA. So stay tuned, Rohit, and I'll show you guys how to do that. Okay. Uh, Claudia says, what to do with reference letters if you were self-employed most of your life? Aha! Okay, let's go back to the um, I'm gonna shift back to our page here. We're gonna go to this site, which is our completeness check site, if you type in EECIC completeness check, you'll get to this. And this is, like I said before during our video, um, this is where you go to understand what you need to do to 
make sure your documents will be accepted. Okay, so let's go to proof of work experience again. And you'll see here, right here, if the applicant is self-employed, this is what you need to do. Okay, it's all right here. So, articles of incorporation or other evidence of business, business ownership. So show that you actually have a business that derives money for you, like you are self-employed. Um, you need to show that you've got self-employment income and documentation from a th third party, such as individuals that have used your services, confirming that they've actually paid you. So remember, the details up here, right above, you have to show your annual salary and benefits. Why? Because the only way you can claim work experience is if it's paid. So you need to provide that. So there's, there's the explanation, all right? You can see here, I will emphasize this once again, just like for reference letters that you can't get from old employers, self-declared main duties or affidavits are not acceptable proof of self-employed work experience. So in and of themselves, they are not. But if you're self-employed, you are going to explain what your duties were. You're going to talk about your business. You're going to provide your articles of incorporation, your tax, your, your, your tax filings as a business, um, a letter from your accountant or your lawyer confirming that your business is real and that you are self-employed. So those are just some of the things you can do. But like I said, you're going to be as creative as you possibly can. Okay, let's flip back and my ugly mug again. Okay. Uh, what is the cost of the step-by-step -step guide in U.S. dollars? Ha, ah, Pamela, do you know what? Um, do you know what, Justin? <laughs> I think uh, we have to check this. Do you know what? I, I think these might be in U.S. dollars. In all honesty, I put Canadian down, but I think this may very well be in U.S. dollars. Wow, I didn't even think of that. I'm so used to dealing with Canadian. Our hosting site is a U.S. company, and uh, they're the ones that host the whole course. And they're an online course hosting company and called Teachable. And um, I actually believe that this is U.S. dollars. So I am so sorry for the confusion. All of you who are looking at it, now I'm going to have to post uh, a message indicating that this is in U.S. funds and not Canadian. So... Um, at least I think that's the case. Justin, you and I, we need to sort that out. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, yes, Justin said this is in U.S. dollars. So there you go. Problem solved, Pamela. <laughs> That'll make things easier for you guys. Um, okay, Nalini says, is it possible to private message you mark with your questions? Okay, Nalini, I get hundreds, almost thousands of questions every week through Facebook Messenger. And it is physically impossible for me to answer everyone's questions privately. So the reason that I um, have created the Express Entry Law Facebook group is so that people can post their general questions there. And then when I answer them, like I said, it benefits the 60,000 people that are doing it. And it will benefit the uh, 10 or 20,000 people who actually watch this video. I fully suspect it's going to be that high. So when I answer your questions, they're benefiting as well. But when it comes to private messages, because it's one-to-one, -one, that's when I charge for those specific questions. And that's where you can book a consultation. So when people send me a private message, I turn them back to the group, the Express Entry Law Facebook group. I invite them to purchase the course, which, which, which is full of um, uh, Q&As. Actually, do you know what? While I'm here... And, I've, and because this is mine and I can do whatever I want, <laughs> I'm going to take a second. And I forgot I was going to show all of you awesome people um, the course. And this is it. Now, I'm just going to go and I'm going to make sure. I'm watching my own screen now. I'm paying close attention to, to, to make sure that um, <clears throat> there it is. Okay, it's up. You can see the course. Now, I'm going to blow this up and make this bigger because it's too small for everyone to see. This is what the course is, guys. And I can't believe I didn't show this. So this is mine. And obviously, I've only completed 1% because I created it. So I don't need to go through and watch them. 
But the first module is all about learning the basics. Welcome to the Express Entry Guide. What is it? How the CRS works. Those of you who know it, you can skip right through it. That's the beauty of this. T then I go, I give the next module is all about preparing to submit your Express Entry Profile. So the top five things to do before you submit it, then how to register for your MyCIC account, and then are you even eligible? <clears throat> Some of you um, who have Canadian work experience, you'll have a different eligibility standard than those who don't have Canadian work experience, okay? So this is the entry, and then once you've got your um, MyCIC account set up right there, then we get right into each of the modules which correspond to every single section of the profile stage. So lessons eight here through all the way down through 22 are all about the profile and getting your ITA. And because some of you are um, single, I have sections devoted strictly to the principal applicant. Others are married, then you can watch the ones for your spouse. And then once you've got those on the profile stage, then I talk about just some general information on <clears throat> submitting your profile. Now, I did leave in here how to register with the job bank. Some of you may want to do it. It's not strict, strictly mandatory anymore, but I did leave it on there just in case you did want to put your profile in and someone miraculously finds you and offers you a job. Then I talk about your profile, the summary page, which is generated once you submit your profile, how to update your profile after, after it's been submitted, and some of you have asked questions about that. Then what it's like to receive an ITA, what it looks like and how to deal with it. Then we get right into one of the most important parts, which is completing the electronic application for permanent residence. So all the different sections associated with it, for you as a principal applicant, for your spouse, and now there are sections for dependents at this stage. And then the overview of comp uh, once your, um, uh, your forms have been completed. Then I have a section devoted strictly to the document checklist and the documents that you have to upload, um, submitting your EAPR, and then sometimes um, you might need to upload documents after your EPR is submitted, and then ultimately the passport request. And then this is the part I'm the most proud of. These are the FAQs, and these all come from you guys. <clears throat> you guys are so awesome. So what I've tried to do is to break them down into general headings so that they're easier to search, okay? So all of these, work experience, education, language, job offers, you can see they're all here, language, everything relating to these various topics, proof of funds, medicals, police clearances, and the list goes on and on and on. So there you go, guys. This is exactly what it is. And in each one, and I'll scroll back here, in each one of these, it is an actual video tutorial, and I'm just going to see if I can start it here. You can see, this screen is a little bit larger than some of the other ones you'll see coming after it, because it is the second version. And the government made changes back on November of 2016, and so I've now updated this. And one of the updates I made was to make the screen larger so that people would be able to better see and I have very fond memories of Portugal and I'm going to say that I was <laughs> All right. So you can see here this is what I do and it is the actual portal. I do a screencast and I record me completing the actual sections you're completing. So when I said it was a complete walkthrough, oh yeah, it's a complete walkthrough. Okay. All right. So let's get back on track here. And because I am so um, scatterbrained, <laughs> all right, let's go here. And I'm going to go back to this. All right, and then back to face. Good. Okay. Um, okay, so I've showed it. All right. I'm trying to remember now. I'm, I'm so scatterbrained, I can't remember exactly which question I was answering. Anyways, okay, so private message, that was, that's what it was. So I created the whole guide for, for people, um, which actually answers a lot of the questions in, in the FAQ section. But because um, I just, I don't have capacity to answer everyone's question, 
I will usually direct people to set up a paid consultation with me and in half an hour I can usually answer all the questions people have. So that's how it works and then I will direct you to my assistant Charlene who then sets up the consults. But it's a consult with me. Alternatively, I charge $210 essentially for a 30 minute consult. My right arm in the office, uh, Billy Young, who is an ex-immigration officer herself for over 13 years, she is a certified immigration consultant, and her fees are half mine. So they're about 105 for a 30-minute consult. So that's what I recommend you do. Okay. All right. Uh, Sandy said, thank you. He studied in the UK. Well, we actually value UK credentials. So you would, you'd be surprised. There's a good chance that it might equate right across. Um, okay. Uh, Zilfikar says, CRS is 380. If I get in IELTS 8777, my knock, uh, do this knock require a person need to be pharmacist? I'm having dual master, MBA, MA. ECA is two bachelors of three years. Okay. Whew. This is a lot. So, uh, Zulfikar, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. Um, okay, I think what you've asked here is, does the NOC require a person to be a pharmacist? Do you know what? This one, Zulfikar, is a little bit too complicated. I'm going to come back and try and answer this one after the video is over, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll try and post uh, a longer response in, in the link. Okay, uh, Tamal says, Hi Mark, I'm having a bachelor's and a certified executive MBA completed here in India at the private university. Will it be counted as a master's degree? Uh, Tamal, the only way you'll know is by getting an educational credential assessment. And um, I'm sure that you guys have probably already seen this, but I'm just going to keep going back and offering as much helpful advice as I possibly can because that's what I do. And we're going to go here and we're going to type in CIC. E C A. And that should take us right here to educational credential assessments. So everyone all over the world needs to go here and they need to select one of these designated organizations for educational credential assessments. And in this case, you'll see here um, one of the more popular ones is the World Education Services. However, uh, the International Qualifications Assessment Service, ICAS, which is based here in Alberta, is also, um, is also a possibility, uh, but any of these really are that relate, except the Medical Council and Pharmacy. Um, that is, uh, those are two separate bodies that are designed specifically for those professions. All right, let's go back here, and then we'll go back to the live part. Okay. Um, okay, Ahmed says he's got 378 petroleum engineer. What's the best bet for me? Ahmed, I suspect that your age is probably higher, so you're losing points, and um, which, which is probably why your score is a little bit lower. But like I said before, language, language, language. You do everything in your power to be able to um, maximize your, your English language scores. And in some cases, don't forget about French. If you speak French, then do both tests. But you can get those bonus points for French. And then you just follow the list. Language, can you increase your education? Can you, uh, can you get a job offer from a company in Canada? Are you able to get a study permit to come and study in Canada, transition to a worker, and then get those extra points? So... Those are all of the factors. And aside from what I advised you before, which was maybe consider listing your spouse as non-accompanying and having him or her come um, after you've already landed as a permanent resident. There's Ralph. Hello, Mark. Ralph is my favorite friend, best buddy, awesomest client who had the most challenging express entry application. And he can tell you guys all about it. But... Um, he was successful, and we had to use modified English language testing scores. And uh, we were successful in doing that. They accepted a modified score. Just, um, I think it was just speaking only. And so <clears throat> Ralph is a testament to the creativity 
of an immigration lawyer. He got through. Congratulations. Okay. All right. We're going to go just a little bit more, and then I better shut it down or I'm going to collapse because I am exhausted. Um, I'll tell you what my day consisted of, just because you guys like these anecdotes. Well, not only did I get to the office <clears throat> a little after 7 this morning um, and work all day getting files out, uh, then I spent some time preparing for this presentation. Then the school today scheduled me for an early volleyball practice. So I rode my bike the half an hour to school because it's a big steep hill I had to climb. It takes me about half an hour from the office to the school. I rode my bike, got there just in time for my volleyball practice from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., two hours. Then after volleyball practice, hopped back on my bike, rode back to my office, then I realized that it was dark, so then I had to run over to the store, which is close to our office downtown, buy this light that I have right here <laughs> so that I wouldn't be in the dark rec talking to all of you, and then race back and get ready. And so that is part of the reason this was so late getting, um, getting posted. So, I'm <laughs> so needless to say, I am exhausted, and I'm going to be hard-pressed to bike home. But anyways... Okay, Olution, um, or which is best? <clears throat> Praying for more rain. Thanks, Alili. <clears throat> All right. When you're applying, you have to have one occupation that is your primary occupation that is being assessed for eligibility. So if, you have, uh, if you're a dentist by profession, have you worked as a dentist? If you haven't, then you'll use your purchasing supervisor. So that's, it's as simple as that. But you can still count your education as a dentist. It doesn't have to be in line with your work experience. So, but I, it looks to me like if you haven't actually worked as a dentist, then just use your purchasing supervisor work experience, which is a skilled NOC uh, level B occupation, and that's what you'll use. Okay, Justin sending the link again. A very, very kind soul. I don't know what I would be doing without uh, if it wasn't for Justin. Okay. What can be done if I do not get police clearance in three months and IRCC started reviewing my documents? All right, Deepak, this is one of the awesome answers that I deal with right in my course. And do you know what? I'm going to show you just because I want to. <laughs> okay, let's go back here. I'm going to go back to my course, and then I'm going to go back here. Oh, not that one. That's the previous lesson. Okay, we're back at the Oh, now. stop automa automatically going. Okay, let's see if I can scroll down here and find it. Uh, da, 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 da. Police clearances. How do I know from which countries? Is that the one? Uh, I think it, police clearances. How do I obtain? Okay, let's see what that one is. Okay, not that one. Here's your answer. And it's a big doozy. This describes all of the situations that could exist, including delays in getting your police clearance. And so what you'll want to do is, and I'll show you the link here. This is where I put all of the information and answers that I have um, to, to the frequently asked questions, which is one that you have asked. So this takes us back here, and then you'll see here that there is... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole section devoted to police clearances, police certificates. So you can see here it describes the exact situations. And then, um, okay, let's see if there's anything specific here. I'm trying to remember if there is. Okay. All right, here we go. So in exceptional circumstances, IRCC may accept proof of having requested it for certain countries and they know which countries are difficult where it takes a long time so proof that you've requested and right here in the place where you're to upload your police clearance you'll provide an explanation of your best efforts okay now look at this not a guarantee of acceptance in other words it's always up to the officer whether they're going to accept your reason for why you could not get your police clearance you need to explain the de in detail um, why your document was delayed and then upload your explanation. 
and your uploaded document, here you go, must show that you requested a police certificate as soon as possible after receiving your ITA. So if you're waiting till, well, 4, 8, we'll say the 10th week, and then you request it, you're not going to get as much leeway or grace from an officer who's determining whether or not to apply exceptional circumstances. All right? Awesome. That's what you're going to get, folks, in our awesome guide. Okay. Here we go. Uh, da, da, da. Great question, says Sandy. Um, okay, Ahmed says his IELTS. Awesome. Thank you, Claudia. <coughs> and you can see that I'm scrolling through these, and they're going quite slow. We have hit the two-hour mark, and I think I need to shut this down. Otherwise, no one's going to even want to watch this video because it's so long. All right, let's go with Sandy. One last one. So I own a property that I rent out, and that is my self-employed income. I am not a limited company, but I do pay tax. I have an accountant. Would my accountant be a third-party individual as proof, or should I use the family who pay each month the tenants? Sandy, passive income is not going to be counted as work experience. So it would be really difficult to get that work experience that you've shown here to, to be considered acceptable. Um, you could be considered a property manager, um, but you would need to show a large portfolio of work because remember, um, I'll show you one last thing and then I'm going to end off with Sandy here. When you are submitting your work experience, and I'm going to go right here, I'm going to close this police certificate, and I'm going to go to work experience. You must meet, actually, no, this isn't where I want to go. I'm going to open up a new window, and I'm going to go FSW eligibility. And then I'm going to open this up, and we're going to look exactly what you need to qualify. Skilled work experience, <clears throat> you can see it must be in the same type within the last 10 years, paid, it must fit as a skilled position within a 0A or B skill level. And then here's the issue that you're going to have, Sandy. At least one year, 1,560 hours total, 30 hours per week, and continuous. So you would have to show that your job requires you to work at this level, that you were doing stuff up to 30 hours per week. Now, I have been a property renter myself, and it, you would be really hard-pressed to show, one, what occupation you're actually filling, and two, that you are meeting the minimum hours per week. So, unfortunately, it's going to be really difficult for you to show that self-employed income unless it's a part of something a lot larger, like managing that portfolio uh, just is one part of a whole bunch of other ones. All right? Well, I'm going to have to shut this down now, guys, but I want to express my sincerest appreciation for all of you who have taken the time to be here with me, to listen to me and my slurred speech, my because of these braces, your patience with my distractions all around me. And um, you guys are awesome. I'm, I'm, I, I consider literally all of you guys my friends. So those of you thousands of other people who are going to be watching this outside, I just want to remind all of you once again that, and I'm going to go back here and share my screen once again, and this time I'm going to jump to the PowerPoint and finish off with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, this is where it is. There's the link. You can find it in the comments that have been posted here. If you're watching on YouTube, this is where you get the link. So you click on this. You've got seven days from today, September the 13th, seven days to take advantage of the 50% off offer. And so as I indicated before, lifetime access is regular $497. And as you've all seen, it's not Canadian anymore. So here's the fun part. I can go in here probably, and right now, 
Let's see if I can do this. There we go. And maybe we need to, to post this. There we go. It's officially changed, everyone. $497 USD is the um is is the the cost. So better save this and go back to full screen. Hopefully it will go back to full screen. Now I've got this little ugly window. Could not be saved. Whatever, I don't care. Okay, so it couldn't be saved. We'll sort it out later. <coughs> Anyways, um, now my computer's saying, Mark, it really is time for you to go. <laughs> Anyways, I'll leave this up here as the last screen, the last thing for you guys to take a look at. This is what allows me, this course is the thing that allows me to offer all of the free advice, all of the free guidance, everything that I do, it's because of this course. It allows me to supplement my income so that I can take the regular hours during the day. Well, the reality is I do it during the evenings and, um, and justify uh, all of the free advice I'm giving. So if, um, if you're interested as well in becoming an affiliate, then Justin and I just leave a, a comment or you can even private Facebook message me and express your interest in becoming an affiliate. And we'll provide you with information and we'll give you your unique access code that you can give to people when they are purchasing the course. And when they put that code in, then that will um, result in you receiving a benefit for that. All right? So that is the scoop. Thanks so much for tuning in. You guys are awesome. And I'm going to shift back now uh, to me here and my ugly mug. And just once again, like I said, express appreciation. And thank you for being a part of this. And uh, I will throw up. Well, not literally throw up. <laughs> I will post this back up here. Express entry, the complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself. Buy it. It's worth it. Take care, everyone. Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, high school teacher, and high school volleyball coach signing off. Wishing you all the best as you navigate this crazy world we call Express Entry.